So, we we'll, uh, continue with uh, our next keynote speaker here today. And uh, this is more a techie uh, person. Uh, you will meet a long life compulsive programmer. And according to his own words, he has now witnessed a shift. With horror, he says, he has witnessed that he now is degraded to a VC-backed PowerPoint presenter. And he will tell us the story of how he grew a small startup company from Sweden into a really international growth company. It's the world's leading graph database company with uh, offices in several countries in Europe and headquarters in Silicon Valley. Welcome Emil Efrem, Neo Technology. Can everyone hear me okay? Mic is working. Thanks, Per. Um, as Per mentioned, my name is Emil Efrem, and I am the founder of an open source project called Neo4j, NEO4j, um, and the CEO of its commercial sponsor, Neo Technology. And today I'm going to tell you a little bit about our story, um, but I'm going to start by telling you uh, very, very strictly um, about the ground rules for this talk because I have really only one ground rule for all my talk, and that is that I do not want your undivided attention. We're in Sweden, unlike where I live today in the valley in San Francisco, you have cell phones, they work here. That's a great thing, use that. Give me feedback, let me know how I'm doing, good or bad, use Twitter. The only thing that I do ask about you is that you tag them with either my name, Emil Afram, at Emil Afram, that's creatively my Twitter username, um, or the hashtag Neo4j, because I monitor both of those uh, religiously. Put together a really simple agenda for the next 30 minutes. Um, it's Neo Technology as of today. What, what's the company uh, as, of, as of today? Um, and then uh, take a step back and talk about the story and a little bit about lessons learned. Uh, so without further ado, uh, let's talk about Neo today. So um, May of 2013, we're a company of almost 50 people. Um, since uh, I enjoy uh, the pain, uh, we're spread out across 10 countries. Um, in four continents. Um, we're an open source project and we have about 50,000 downloads of our software every month. Uh, we send out heartbeats uh, when you start up your, your database, when you've downloaded a Neo4j database, we send out a heartbeat. And there's now more than a thousand new people starting up using Neo4j every day, which is pretty astounding. We raised a total of $25 million from illustrious investors, all of which are in this room today, <laughs> which is kind of cool. Um, and today we are the world leader in graph databases. So what, what's a graph database? Well, some people talk about graph databases these days. When we first started talking about them, we were the only people. We actually coined the term uh, uh, a while back, uh, several years back. But now some analysts say things like, it's arguable that graph databases will have a bigger impact on the database landscape than Hadoop. And if you're a techie, that means it's big. If you're not a techie, I guess you don't even know what Hadoop is. So then that quote doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, the other uh, question, uh, the other quote that I have here is one about big data, which I think most people have heard about. And they talk about graph analysis as the true killer app for big data. This is done, uh, um, comment by Forrester Research, who's one of the biggest uh, analyst in institutes in the world. Um, so what is it that we do? What, what is the product? Well, so. It's a database, which means that it stores information, and there's a bunch of different types of databases around today, and they all differ in the building blocks that they expose to the programmer. So the most uh, prominent and popular ones are called relational databases, or SQL databases, and they work with tables, like Excel. So you take your information and you structure them in tables. Um, our database instead works with nodes, typed relationships between nodes and then key value pairs that you attach to these nodes. So let's, let me break that down for you. It's basically a model that is inspired by how the human brain works. The human brain has neurons with synapses connecting these neurons that builds up a large network. So for example, I may be a node and I'm connected to uh, the sting day, right? And the relationship between me and the sting day, and the sting day is that I'm speaking here. Uh, Sting Day is in Stockholm. Stockholm is in Sweden. I work at Neo Technology. Neo Technology is uh, funded by three VCs, etc. That builds up a large network or a graph, and we natively store those. 
So that's kind of cool, uh, but what's the benefit of that? Well, there are several benefits with that, um, and I'm not going to talk too, too much about them. I'm going to focus on one of them, which is performance. So uh, a while back, we were contacted by one of the biggest social networks in the world, and they said that we've been looking at all these kinds of new databases, and we think they're really interesting, and then we found graph databases, and we love them. And, but we're big social network X, and so the, really, the only thing that we care about is performance. So how about you send us a benchmark? And uh, us being the honest uh, Swedish geeks that we are, we, we said that, look, we're not going to do benchmarks because you can prove anything with benchmarks. There's a saying in, for, for the geeks in here uh, about lies, damn lies, statistics, and then benchmarks. I mean, and so we said, so rather than that, how about you give us a scenario that you think is relevant and we'll show you our numbers. And so they did that. They said, what if you have a social network of a thousand people, like in this room, you grab two people at random, you check to see if they're connected. Not even how they're connected, but even if they're connected. You can imagine a social network like Facebook or LinkedIn or something like that want to do that kind of operation many, many times per second, right? As they lo load the front page, you want to know what kind of news stories you're going to show, etc. So we implemented that in MySQL, which is the other Swedish open source database company, which is a traditional SQL model. Um, and with 1,000 people, it's a 2,000 millisecond operation. So we added that to Neo4j instead, and with 1,000 people grabbing two people at random, check to see if they're connected, it's a 2 millisecond operation. So it's 1,000 times faster. That's kind of interesting. But we upped the ante a little bit. So we added a million nodes to this database. And 50 average friends of 25 million connections, all running on my laptop. We grabbed two people at random in this one million person big social network to see if they're connected, and it's still a two millisecond operation. So that's very, very interesting. Uh, if there's one thing that I want you to take away from this talk, it is that Neo4j graph databases are a thousand times faster than relational databases on a thousand times as much data thousand times faster. That's interesting because if you're 20 or 30 percent faster, that's usually good. If it's software, I mean, that's, that's useful. Then you don't need to buy new hardware for another six months or so. If you're a thousand times faster, that means you can do completely new things. So that's pretty extraordinary. So anyway, so that's the product. Um, I'm saying that, and I'm bound to say that because I'm the, the, the CEO and the, the, the main advocate for the company. But other um, Companies have also realized this. So we have a bunch of customers using us right now, up and running in production, using Neo4j for sol to solve various problems. We're going to zoom back to customers later, but now let's first take a step back and talk about the story. So the story actually started out quite a while ago. We started out, in fact, in 2000. Back in 2000, the founders of Neo Technology all worked at a Swedish enterprise content management uh, company. Um, and uh, we had the problem of, we had a bunch of images, we had a decentralized model where uh, people all over the world could tag those images with words in order to index them with the content. And so, for example, we might have an image of a house, some guy in Spain may pick that up and tag it with uh, Casa, right? And the problem we had was that we also had customers in Germany, and they wouldn't search for Casa, they would search for Das Haus, right? or someone in, in, in the UK would search for house, the English version of house, right? Um, so we built a small engine that basically took Casa and Das House and house and connected them and said that they're all the one thing, they're all the abstract notion of house. But not only that, we extended it because we wanted to be able to say that houses are buildings so that if you search for, I don't know, the, the, the Spanish word for building, but the Spanish word for building, you would find something that has been tagged with hut, for example, in English. A hut is a building, right? Um, and that was the first time when we had a problem and we saw that we had this little small engine where we could structure data not in tables, um, but in connections between things, nodes and relationships, networks, or what's now called graphs. Graph is the ma mathematical term for networks. So as I tell this story, I'm going to talk to it through a metaphor. And that metaphor is called transition curve theory. And I first learned about transition curve theory from Tim Ferriss, the four hour work week guy. And it talks about these five stages of entrepreneurship, which I, which I really love. 
The first phase is when you're starting out, uninformed optimism. You have a new idea, it's great, it's fantastic, the world deserves it, and nothing can go wrong. And then you start building it, and it's like, holy shit, that was really difficult to build. And does anyone of the customers really want this? Did we even try this out early? What's this lean startup thing? You're supposed to validate this hypothesis. You start doing that, turns out that people don't really want it, and it was super difficult to build. That's the informed pessimism stage. It all goes downhill from there until you get to this pivotal point, this crisis of meaning, this crossroads, where you can either power through and iterate and change and figure out how you map your product to the world, and then you go into informed optimism, or you go under, you go and crash and burn, the five stages. It's early 2000 and we're definitely here, and we look glorious. These are two of the three co-founders of Neo Technology, um, and it's 2000, and we're at Sebit in Hanover, and we're blindly optimistic. We're uninformed, and we're optimistic. Um, and there's a bunch of stuff that I could zoom in and talk to you about when it came to building the product, uh, but it's very technical, um, and it goes on for quite a while. Suffice to say that we spent several years uh, writing prototypes on this notion, this idea that we had that the world actually is a connected place and a lot of information today is evolving very rapidly and it's really unfit, really poor fit to squeeze that into square and static tables. But if we instead can use networks and graphs to model that, that should be really powerful. So we built a bunch of prototypes, we threw most of them away. By 2003, we put something in production and rewrote our entire enterprise content management uh, uh, application. Remember, back then, we were still an applications company um, on top of this new database, and we were blown away by it. And so we keep building it, we keep refining it until 2007. So seven years, years later, when we start saying things like, hey, the world deserves this, and we're blindly optimistic, and we say, this thing is really cool, really valuable, and it's working really well for us, and I think it could, could uh, uh, solve a lot of problems for other people. So we spin out the company, um, and we start working. Well, we keep working. And some of you may think here, uh, wait, what just happened 2000 to 2007? That's a long time to be focusing on product. And, and that's true, that, that is a long time. We live in a world now where uh, m many entrepreneurs have the notion that you're supposed to write an, a photo sharing application in three months and then flip it three months later, right? Um, you know, it's funny, I was, I, I was um, in, at University Cafe in Palo Alto, which is the heart of heart of Silicon Valley, the day after the Instagram acquisition was announced. You know, Instagram was acquired by Facebook for a billion dollars. And I'm sitting there and I'm working and right next to me is a, is a couple and they're chit-chatting and I'm overhearing them a little bit. And at one point, the, the guy leans forward to, to the girl and says, your mouth says I love you, but your eyes say I wish you had founded Instagram. <laughs> I thought that one was uh, pretty extraordinary. So we live in this world, right, where, where you're expected to do shit like that. You build a, an application in three months and bam, you sell it f three months later for a billion dollars, right? There were 12 people, Kevin and Yang, when they got, got acquired, right? That has not been my experience at all. And the time that I invest in product is, has never been better invested. And that's one of the key learnings for me, is that product is the high order bit. And especially when you're a technical founder, you're going to have a bunch of people telling you that VCs, um, even awesome coaches as amazing incubators like, like Sting, um, advisors, people will tell you to focus on go-to-market and commercialization and sales and marketing and execution and stuff like that. And those things are really important. Um, if you have a well-run sales organization, that's the difference between hitting $800,000 in, in bookings one year or hitting a million dollars, which is, that's really, really important. Um, but the product, that's the angle of the product, is what truly controls your high order trajectory. That, that's the difference between meeting a million or 10 million or 100 million dollars, that, those kind of numbers. And the time that I invest in product has never been better invested. So that's one key learning um, for me. This is 2007. By this point, I live in Linköping, and we move into the lead incubator um, in, in Linköping, was, which was extraordinarily helpful for us for the first 18 months. Um, we end up raising a really small, I, I call it an angel round when I speak in the US, but it's, I guess, a government-funded uh, round. It's Innovationsbron, the Innovations Bridge, or whatever it's called in, in English. Um, and uh, of an one and a half million Swedish kroner at the end of 2007, so 200,000 US dollars, roughly. Um, but really, at this point, we're mainly 
bootstrapped. We have some consulting engagements with some of the big universities in Sweden, all around the product, all around Neo4j, but no real product sales. But we're, we we work doing doing work on the product on, on a consulting basis. So we use that money, the the 200k, to start fundraising, uh, basically. So I fundraise in order to to, to start fundraising. Um, and we kick, have a kickoff event in this building. Does anyone here know the building? There's a House of Glass, House of Sweden in, uh, in Washington, D.C. So the U.S. Embassy, no, sorry, the Swedish Embassy in the U.S. And there was a big event where we tried out our story for the first time for U.S. investors. I was really determined to raise money from, from the Valley because supposedly they have the best investors in the world. And I wanted to see, does our story even work in the Valley? We got super a positive response over there. We were invited over to visit with some of the best firms and had a really good time, but we felt that it was a little bit early. So we went back over the summers. We worked on our pitch. We even interacted with uh, a couple of Swedish VCs, and we actually even got a verbal on a term sheet from one of the early stage, one of the few early stage VCs based here in Stockholm. And, and they said that we, at the time we were raising a $5 million round, 30 million Swedish kroner. Um, and they said, no, we can't do the whole thing. Uh, but we can do two and a half million of that, either alone um, or if you can find someone else to syndicate. And the young and naive CEO made a huge tactical mistake, which was, he said, of course, I'll just go to the Valley and pick up another two and a half million dollars, uh, which was a mistake on so many fronts. Do you guys remember 2008? What ended up happening after that summer was this, right? You know? And it's a funny thing. So I, one of our earlier proof of concept customers was Lehman Brothers. And I'm actually literally go, walk, going into a plane the Monday morning when they went bankrupt. So I go onto a plane in, in Copenhagen, I fly over, I land to start my fundraising tour. When I land, Lehman Brothers don't even exist anymore. Well, that was pretty crazy. Um, so we did that. We were a month in, in the valley and tried to raise money from these guys. I had re really good conversations, but ultimately it became very clear that we were not good enough to get money from them at that point. Um, and uh, it was also really, really difficult because they hardly even invested in the valley, let alone to someone over in Sweden. So at that point, I say like, all right, cool. I'm going to fly back to Sweden and take that early stage VC here in Stockholm up on their word and say that, hey, you guys, we're willing to put in two and a half million alone. So I fly back, come back here, and they say basically, sorry, Sam, it was a completely different world when we last spoke. Capitalism is sinking, you know, the world is sinking into the ocean, basically, now. And we made a decision to not do any invest investments alone. Uh, so you need to find a syndication partner. And then we're happy to do it. So that kind of sucked, because um, there were no syndication partners in Scandinavia, right? I mean, I'd already done that, that work. But there was some glimmer of hope. This is 2008, right? So we're here. We're not at the bottom just quite yet. Don't worry, we'll get there. Um, but we're not quite at the bottom. There's a glimmer of hope. There, I may be able to convince some of the Scandinavian VCs. So I spent some time doing that, um, and by early 2009, I've found actually a Finnish investor that is willing to syndicate with the, with the VC here in Stockholm. Um, and we end up signing a term sheet, and it's like, fuck yeah. You know, we were almost there, right? We signed a term sheet, and it's pretty, pretty tough times. We had, have around 300,000 Swedish kroner on our bank account, so you know, it's, it's, it's pretty tough. Um, and after you sign a term sheet, as probably most of you here know, and some of you will know, um, after you sign the term sheet, you go through all this due diligence where you look through all the legals of the, co of the company, the accounting, and look into the technology and patents and stuff like that, right? Most of this expense, by the way, is on the company, of course, which makes sense in some logical VC way. Um, so you, we end up doing that for a couple of months, and, uh, and we also, uh, during this time, I, I forgot to mention that, a really important part is that you go from the term sheet, which is five pages, give and take, into a shareholders agreement, which is 100 pages. So the lawyers have a lot of fun with that, right? So we're now at a point, it is um, March 18, it's a Wednesday, um, and we've gotten to a point where we have the final shareholders agreement, everything is done. We have everything, we've gone through the DD, everything checked out, we were all okay. And I get a phone call, um, and they tell me that the deal is over. The deal is out. They're walking from the deal. And it is Wednesday, uh, March 18. I have six people in the team, including myself. Um, and uh, it's seven days to, pal to salary, to payroll, here in Sweden, as you guys probably know, March 25. And we have 19,000 kroner in the bank account. That's when you're here. That's when you're here. So that was not fun, <laughs> um, but we hustle and we make it happen and we do 
we do what we do. Uh, we're entrepreneurs, right? We make it happen. Uh, so we, you know, by noon that day, I had all my guys out in consulting. Um, by Thursday, I had convinced the customers that I can send invoices early. By Friday, I had sold the invoices to a factoring firm, so I had cash in, in the company. And then we made it happen, right? But that moved on to a very different... Uh, oh, no, actually, this is a really important lesson learned first, right? Passion. Like, there's no way you can subject yourself to the pain of running a startup unless you truly love it. And, you know, I have the best job in the world, and I even, even back then felt like I had the best job in the world, even though it was sort of a shitty circumstance. Um, but that's a, a key passion, and this is not something that it's, that's just the founders, but like the entire team. We're three founders and three employees who all stuck through with us and went out and, and prostituted themselves writing boring systems as consultants uh, just to get cash into the company, and which I'm forever grateful. Um, so now we moved on to a different phase, right? Um, basically, the, this phase. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I'm tired of dancing with, with VCs, you know, let's actually build a company. So we, we go heads down and we focus on coding, we focus on building product, we focus on delivering value to customers. And we do that for, for about three and four months. And then I get a call from, uh, from another VC that I know, who's actually in the audience here today, um, Søren from, from Northcap in, in Denmark. We had some early conversations, uh, ended up deciding not to do it, um, uh, but still kept in contact and he's a great guy. And he gives me a call and he says basically, look, I run the, the European tech tour and I would love for you guys to be there. And I'm like, said this basically? <laughs> you know, no, we don't want to do that. Like we're not in this, like we're building actual value, real value now, not CPR, not synthetic. This is real, you know, we're not doing that anymore. And it's like, fine, okay, I understand that. And he hangs up and blah, blah, blah. And then I keep working for a couple of days and then he calls me back again. And he says, no, I can't accept that. You guys are just too good. You need to present here. I'm like, fine. And I fill out one of these forms that the entrepreneurs in this room surely know, which is explain your business ID in 18 words. And then explain your business model in 443 characters. And then explain a go-to-market strategy in rhyme. I mean, they're all different, these forms. And, and like, you need to like, invest like several hours per form. And it's supposedly because it's good for you. Because if you can't trivialize your entire company into four or five words, you're never going to be successful. So I go through that and fill out the form, and I actually get accepted to, to the tech tour, which was, um, which was good, which is interesting. So um, all of a sudden, we're doing that again, right? So I, 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 I do my dance, I do my pitch, and I talk to them. Um, and actually, after that pitch, uh, Sunstone Capital, my, my good friend Christian, who's in the room here uh, today as well, uh, walks up to me with his partners at Sunstone Capital, one of the best VCs out of, out of Copenhagen. Um, and he says, basically, we want to fund you guys. Um, except we, 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 we can't do it alone because we need a syndication partner. <laughs> uh, okay, here we go again. All right, so at that point, I actually uh, pick up the phone and I call my good friend Sammy at Connor Venture Partners out of Helsinki, and I say, dude, we'd, we'd been talking for, for quite some time at that point, um, and he wanted to invest, but at the time, Connor did not lead investments in Sweden. Uh, now they do, so they're a great, uh, great firm for, for all the Swedish entrepreneurs to talk to. Um, but, but at the time they didn't, so I told them, we have a lead partner who can lead the deal and you guys can, can uh, follow on and we can fill up the round and we can make it happen. And so that's what happened. So end of 2009, we, um, we raised a two and a half million dollar seed round from Connor Venture Partners and, and from Sunstone Capital, um, which, was, uh, which was great. And so we've, you know, we were here, we looked at the abyss, right, but uh, through mainly luck, truth to be told, but also a lot of hard work, we managed to pull ourselves up from here and here, and we're starting to get towards the informed optimism phase. Since then, we've moved on to raise more money. We raised an $11 million round from Fidelity, uh, Fidelity Growth Partners Europe, uh, out of London, which is also a fantastic firm to work with. Um, and then we raised an $11 million Series B uh, almost six months uh, ago today. I wanna, don't want to talk too much about this, because. One of the things that I dislike about these kinds of talks is that there's, all, there's so much talk about fundraising and funding, and I, I do it myself. I mean, that's basically what my talk has been about, right? But that's not what it's really about. What it's really about is showing value to customers. I mean, that's, that's, that's real value, right? Um, and I'm going to talk about that a little board, bit more in a, um, uh, in, in a few minutes. Uh, but before that, I want to throw the key number three lesson learned out there. And I, I struggled with putting this one up there because it's such a cliche, right? You know, people, 
people, it's all about people. But that's, you know, I said before that product is the high order bit. People truly is the highest order bit. And I have so many stories about this. I'm running short on time here. So I'm going to tell you uh, a, a short one. Um, in spring of 2011, uh, I started looking for my first sales leader. Uh, at that point, up until that point, the founders and the team have done all the selling themselves. But I, I felt that, okay, we're, it's now time to bring on structured professional sales uh, leadership into the company. And there was only one ground rule that I had. Well, I, I wanted to get along with the person, but only really one ground rule, which was, it must not be a Swede. <laughs> you know, I'm Swedish, I, I like Swedes. You, you, we're all great, but we're horrible at selling, right? We're great engineers, but we're horrible at selling, generally. Um, so I, like, I'm, I, I can recruit anyone, but not a Swede. So what ends up happening, however, is I reach out through my graph and I get an introduction to someone that everyone in my graph tells me is a fantastic person. His name is Lars Nordwall, which sounds suspiciously Swedish. <laughs> um, so I end up meeting with him. He's based in the Valley. It turns out that he's been in the Valley for 15 years, so he's very Americanized, an Americanized Swede. And my ambition has always been to build an American company with a Swedish soul. And by that I mean I want to have American ambitions, American aggressiveness, but I want uh, to keep, I think Swedes, Swedish companies are great at treating their employees in a very humane and, and great way. And I want to marry the two, right? And I feel like, oh, this can be a great guy for that, right? Um, and I start looking around and I start talking to people uh, uh, about him, about Lars, and, and I get really high signal. Uh, back saying that he's a fantastic guy. One example, uh, one of the, in fact, what I think is the best VC on the planet is Peter Fenton at Benchmark Capital. Um, and I have a, um, we, we, we talk once in a while and um, uh, and I bring, I have a couple of candidates at that point, I bring them to him and I get his input on what candidates. And when he sees Lars' name in there, he's just like, this guy is phenomenal. You should do, like, drop everything you're doing, you should just get this guy right now. Um, he's, on the, he's the only venture investor on the board of Twitter. He's invested in SpringSource, JBoss, probably the most successful venture capital of, of this generation. Um, and he says, any one of my portfolio companies, he can get a job at any time, immediately. So I'm like, all right, okay, I, I get it. Like, so I go out and I talk to Laura. I mean, we, we already had, had talked at that point and I managed to, to, to recruit him. And he's been completely transformational for the company. Um, you know, I had already built, or we had already built, uh, a world-class engineering team at the time. You know, half of my guys have a Wikipedia page about them on the engineering side. Like, completely illustrious, super awesome engineers, rock stars, re really rock stars. But Lars built a world-class sales and marketing organization, which is something that is not in my DNA, because I'm a technical founder, right? Um, so, what has happened on that side, talking about sales and marketing? So when we set out in 2010, we had a hypothesis about the early adopters for graph databases. This is a new market. We're evangelizing. We're creating a new product category. Um, and this was the hypothesis. There were three verticals. And by the way, I realized the irony of showing you guys a table. <laughs> I, I do realize that. But there are three verticals that are the early adopters for graph databases. The first one is the software category. The second one is finance and insurance, and, the, and then datacom and telecom. And we have four key use cases that we saw. As th this should be the early adopters. This is, this is probably where people are going to use graph databases. And the scorecard in 2011 looks like this. And as you can see here, these are some very interesting brands. You can see HP, Cisco, Deutsche Telekom, huge companies like Bloomberg, SFR, etc as well as small hyped startups like Glassdoor.com or Viadeo, which is the second largest professional network after LinkedIn, or Bright.com. So that's kind of interesting, uh, good stuff. Uh, but what really blew us away was in 2012, because then this matrix expanded, and we saw traction in many, many verticals, in logistics, in education, in defense, in retail, and the use cases just kept expanding. I should mention here that I, I'm in the, uh, unfortunately we can't, we can't mention most of our customers' names in pub public, uh, so these are the ones that we can talk about. Uh, but also, really importantly, these are all paying customers, not consulting gigs, but actually paying pro product customers who've all written a check of $10,000 recurring revenue or more to the company. So these are real customers. And this to me speaks to the complete horizontal uh, possibilities of the graph database. I think that your toasters by the end of this decade will run graph databases. Everywhere where there's software, there's going to be a graph database, which I think this spe um, speaks to. 
And we have happy customers. This is a lovely quote. Uh, two things Sweden gave to the world, Nina Passion from the Cardigans and Neo4j. Thank you, Sweden. <laughs> I think it's lovely anytime you can be associated with Nina Passion. <laughs> I think that one is awesome. So what are the key lessons learned then? Well, product is the high order bit. Um, second, passion is not uh, an optional ingredient. It's a required one. You have to have it. The third one is that people is actually the highest order bit. And a bonus. I'm going to tell you a bonus really quickly because we're rapidly running out of time. Um, how many here is familiar with crossing the chasm? Yeah, all hands are up, right? So crossing the chasm theory. Um, and the question is, where are we on that now, right? Well, remember this other model that I talked to you about before, the one with transition curve theory? And you can see how you get from here, from, from, you know, if you avoid the crash and burn phase, you get to informed optimism, and you slide into the early majority, and it's all awesome, right? In 2012, we were here. We were past the informed optimism phase. And in 2013, we're breaking into the early majority. It's fantastic. Except, no, it's not. <laughs> That's not how it works. That was, in, that was in theory. In practice, this is how it works. <laughs> you start out in 2000, and then you get here at some point, and then there are many, many, many years until you get to the chasm. Uh, I think 2013 is when we're getting close to the chasm. Uh, it's taken a few years. Um, so the real lesson learned here, and the fourth lesson learned, is that of persistence. Persistence is a, is a lovely word for me because it means the data layer in, in, in software architecture, the persistence layer is where the database lives. Um, but it also means endurance, uthålighet in, in Swedish, right? Um, and that's clearly one of the lessons uh, learned for me. So for me, it's product is the high order bit. Passion is not an optional, it's a required ingredient in order to survive the roller coaster that so, like the both previous talkers have alluded to. Um, people is actually the highest order bit. bit. And then finally, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a huge um, advocate for getting a lot of advisors around you. Um, you know, uh, advisors from, from Sting, for example, or uh, VCs or, or, or other people that can coach you and tell you, tell you what to do and, and give you an advice on, on what to do. But there's something about this persistence thing. There, there, there is a time when, at least for me, it's been really important to not listen to what everyone else is, is saying, but actually trust your instinct and you know, follow your heart and finally be persistent in order to get to the end. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Emil. Uh, great to hear. Um, I have a question for you, or several questions. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> but but it, it, it's interesting here. Um, it, it's uh, 13 years. So far. It's 13 years. Many more to come. Yeah. I think that's sort of... I mean, often today we say everything is much quicker. But perhaps it isn't. It takes time. Uh, there was one thing I would like to, to uh, hook on to, uh, talking about selling. Um, and you say that in Sweden we're not really that good at that. So what's the advice if you can't get that man that uh, you hired in Silicon Valley? Bec and you can't get that. No. Guy. Okay. Well, you sure? <laughs> 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 yes. Okay. So, so don't even try. Yeah, but, that's but right. Okay. So what are we going to do instead? If you have a startup here in Sweden and uh, you need that guy but you can't hire him, how do we sort of inject real good selling people in Sweden? So, uh, two comments on that. The first one is that I think early on, you don't. Early on, the founders and the CEO should do all the selling, because then it's mainly an evangelical sell. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, uh, get that first customer traction by yourself, step one. Um, step two, when you really need professional sales leadership, in my experience, um, has been when you want to create the machine, right? You want to create the machine. Yeah. and you know, I'm, you know, I'm at a loss. I moved to the valley in order to find that person, um, not just to find that person, but, but partially to find that yeah. person. And I think that's one of the key benefits of the valley is that all non-engineering types are just so extraordinary. You can find top-rated market talent, top-rated sales talent, etc. Um, but 
of course they exist here as well. I mean, I'm, I'm at least 90% full of shit when I'm on stage. 90% at least. So, and, and I, I haven't Welcome. exhausted the, yeah. And I haven't exhausted the Swedish market. I'm sure there's great sales uh, yeah. experience here, but the way I solved it was by moving to the valley. So before you ha are in that size that you can hire a real professional and build a sales organization, you on your own have to be a good yes. salesman. Yeah. Okay. So that's also an important takeaway. So thank you a lot, Emil Efrem. Thank you. Big hand. Awesome. And Thanks. at present, Great. we help build companies in West Africa. Thanks a lot for Thanks. coming here.